out and he spotted me in the congregation and he looked out and he said, I see that Florence Littower is here this morning. Why don't we have her come up and say a few words? Now, those of you that know me know it's no problem for me to say a few words. In fact, the problem is saying only a few words. So I started up the aisle. It was one of those churches that was like a cathedral, had a long center aisle, somewhat like a bowling alley. And all the people in that church came early to sit in the back, lest they get too near the pastor and become spiritual. So they were all back there. I was about in the middle. And as he called me up, I started down the aisle. And then the pastor got a better idea. He said, why don't we have Florence do the children's sermon? I'd never done a children's sermon. I had no idea of what to do. I didn't have one ready. But I could hardly stop mid-aisle and say, I don't do children's sermons. I continued up the aisle, and as I did, all the little children came out and followed me. I felt like the Pied Piper as I came up front. They filled in all those empty pews, and as I was coming up, I shot up an emergency prayer. And I said, Lord, give me a children's sermon. Now, it's all right once in a while to send up an emergency prayer as long as the Lord knows who you are. It's a little late to get acquainted. But if he knows you, he'll hear you. And so he heard that, and he said to me, Ephesians 4.29. Now, that ran through my mind as I'm walking up the aisle. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, as that went through my mind, I thought, those are big words for little children. However, by then, I was up front, and I had no plan B. So I turned, and I looked at this group of children, and I said, do you think that you could learn one verse today? They were a bright and eager group, and they nodded. Oh, yes, they could learn a verse. And I said, well, what we're going to do, any time you take a piece of scripture, is you have to ask, what does it say, what does it mean, and how does it apply to me? If it doesn't apply to me, then I might as well be reading some other book. So it has to apply in my life. So we're going to take this apart, and first I'm going to tell you what it says. Now, here they are, bright, and I said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good, good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, by the time I finished that, their confidence level had dropped. <laughs> and they were sitting there looking wide-eyed at me, like, how can we ever understand that? And I said, now, what we have to do is take this apart. What is communication? Oh, that's talking, they said. And I said, well, that's right, but if I go and, and lock myself in a closet and shut the door and talk all afternoon, am I communicating? Oh, no. I said, what does it take for me to communicate? There has to be another person, and the other person has to listen. I talk to couples every single day with problems. They all physically can talk, but they all tell me, we can't communicate. Why not? Because no one is listening. They're only keeping their mouths shut until someone finishes the sentence so they can jump in, talking, but not communicating. So we talked about that, and they realized that to communicate, you not only have to have words, but someone has to listen. Someone has to care. I said, all right, now what would be corrupt communication? Well, one little boy called out. He said, bad words. I said, that's right. That is corrupt communication, bad words. I said, now give me an example. I was sorry I asked that. <laughs> because they started giving me bad words. I said, no, 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 I didn't want to hear bad words. They hadn't had this much fun in church in many a Sunday. <laughs> I said, no, no, I just want to know what kinds of things are bad words. Oh criticism, insulting people, swearing, vulgar language. One little child said, saying nasty things to your mother. I said, that's right. That is corrupt communication. None of that. Now, I said, this is what the Bible tells us not to do. Let no corrupt communication, bad words, come out of our mouth. I said, now, what does it say we should do? The Bible never tells us what not to do unless it tells us what we should do. It says that we should give out words that are good but not just good, good to the use of edifying. What's it mean to edify? Well, they looked wide-eyed and one child said, building up. I said, that's right. What it means is that when my words come out of my mouth, they should build people up. And one little boy called out and he said, you mean our words should be like building blocks? I said, that's right. I'd never thought of that before. I thought, my, these children are creative. 
Why have I wasted my time on adults? Uh, here we've got all these little children with active minds. And he said, we, if we could think of our words like building blocks. And that stopped me and I thought, wouldn't it be good if, if every time I opened my mouth, I could think of what came out of my mouth as, as a little building block? And that when I talk to you, some of you may have just a little pitiful pile of blocks. Maybe nobody said much nice to you. Maybe you had a parent who said, you're the dumb one, you're the slow one. Why aren't you smart like your brother? Why aren't you beautiful like your sister? What's the matter with you? If it weren't for you, I could have had a decent life. Some of us are just carrying around a little tiny pile of blocks. And what I might say out of my mouth might add a big amount to that little pile of blocks of self-worth. And I thought about that, and I thanked the child. And as we were commenting on this, one little child called out and said, and we should not go around and knock other people's piles of blocks down. I thought, that's right. Isn't that easy to do? None of us have to take courses on how to insult others. None of us have to take courses on how to say mean and nasty things. Those things seem to come out quite naturally. Many of us go around not only not building up other people, but knocking down what others have said. As we went along, I got to the last part, which said that we should minister grace unto the hearers. I said, does anyone know what grace is? One little girl raised her hand. She says, grace is God's unmerited favor. I said, oh, good. I was thrilled with this little intelligent child. I said, tell me, what does that mean? She said, I have no idea. <laughs> she'd learned it in Sunday school, but she'd never quite applied it to her life. She didn't know what it meant, but at least she knew it. So I thanked her for knowing it. I said, that's good. Now, what that means is that we are going to give out favors to other people. We're going to do good things for them. And that when we open our mouths, what comes out of our mouth should do a favor. It should minister grace. It should be like a little verbal present, like a little gift. And I thought about that. How many of us mothers in the room today, when your children take the first look at you in the morning, which may be a frightening experience in itself, when they look at you, do they say, there's mother. Wait till she opens her mouth. Out will come little gifts. And your children stand around just with their hands out. More, mother, more. Oh, wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't it be great if in the afternoon they brought home all their friends and they said, oh, wait till you meet my mother. Every time she opens her mouth, out come little verbal presents. Oh, wouldn't that be great? And as we went on with this, I said, let's review what we've said. And so I had them fill in the blanks that we are not to give out bad words, only good words, words that build up, don't knock down, words that give a present, little verbal gifts to other people. And when we finished this, I was so happy that we had made a children's sermon out of this. One little girl stood up in the aisle. She turned around to the entire church and she said in a loud, clear voice, what she means is, I think it's always good to have a child in the audience to interpret the speaker for the adults who didn't get it. <laughs> what she means is our words should be like a little silver box with a bow on top. Now, when she said that, the whole congregation went, oh, <laughs> let me see if you can do that. Oh, that's good. Now, when I heard that, I said to myself, if that child who is not the speaker can get that kind of a reaction out of a Sunday morning congregation, that's got to be a good line. So I put that away <laughs> in my mind. And I said that someday you're going to make a message off of that, that our words should be like a little silver box with a bow on top. A few years later, I was asked to speak at a church and they wanted me to speak on encouraging words. And I had salted that little thought away. And so I pulled it out and I thought, I'll make a message off of that. I'll talk about silver boxes, the gift of encouragement. And so I shared with them that night on a Sunday evening. And I was in this particular church, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday evenings. So Sunday evening, I shared that message with the congregation. The next night, Monday night, a lady walked in. She came up to me. She had this little box in her hands. And she said to me, she said, today I was out in a Christmas tree store. And she said, I saw this little ornament. And it's to hang on your Christmas tree. But she said, it's a little silver box with a bow on top. She says, when I saw it, I thought of your message last night. She said, I bought it for you. Here, take it home. And the next time you walk by your Christmas tree, you'll see that. And it will remind you that your words are to be like a little silver box with a bow on top. I took that and kept it. That same night, another lady came up to me. 
This lady was a very choleric lady. She walked up very tough and she said to me, last night after I listened to your message, I realized that I have not said a good word to my husband in years. <laughs> Behind her was a teenage daughter looking over her mother's shoulder at me, nodding, yes, yes, yes. And she said, so I went out in the garage, brought a whole bunch of old Christmas boxes, wrapped them up in silver paper, put a bow on the top of each one. And she said, I have placed one of these in every room of my house to remind me that when I open my mouth, it should be like a gift, like a little silver box with a bow on top. She gave me the box. I also had other people that came up and commented, and I found out that if people could see, see visually what it was that their words were to be, that when they opened their mouths, no corrupt communication should come out, but only things that build up, don't knock down, things that are like a verbal gift. Now, as I began to work on this, I thought about my own life. And I thought about, Florence, have you given encouraging words to your children? And as I thought about this, I realized that it's been easy for me to give encouraging words to my two daughters. They've pretty much, Lauren has always done the right thing. And she got good marks in school. And I was able to hand her silver boxes frequently because she did the right things. Then I thought about Marita. Marita never did anything right. But what she did wrong was cute. <laughs> Do you have a child like that? Does everything wrong and you say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. And then you laugh and hug them and let them know that you really enjoyed what it was they did bad. <laughs> I remember the day she stole money out of my wallet and went and bought me a geranium. Now, you can't get angry at a child who steals from you and then gives you gifts back. <laughs> so I realized I'd given her a lot of silver boxes that she didn't even deserve. Then I thought about my son. I realized I hadn't given him many silver boxes. I realized that I hardly ever had said really uplifting things to him. Because you see, his personality is not like mine. And he has never gotten too enthused over me. So I thought about it, and I remembered the time that he came home from school when he was in high school, and he said to me, it amazes me that people pay money to hear you talk. <laughs> Now, you could hardly consider that a silver box. <laughs> he said, that must be because they don't have to listen to you for nothing. <laughs> that wasn't any better either. I remember thinking about that. So when that ran through my mind, I thought, no wonder I don't say nice words to him. He hasn't said anything nice to me. But then I realized that that verse does not say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth unless they don't say anything good to you, in which case it's all right. <laughs> I realized that I was responsible to say the right thing, whether or not. I got a response. And as I was thinking about that, I remembered one day what I'd said to him. I remembered one day he came home and he said to me, Mrs. Johnson says, I have a charming personality. Now here's a teenage son that had hardly spoken to me in years. And he's coming home and telling me that this lady thinks he's charming. Now I wish I had said the right thing. I wish I had said, Mrs. Johnson is right. You do have a charming personality. I wish I'd said that. But you know what I said? He walked in, he said, Mrs. Johnson says I have a charming personality, and I shot right out. I'd sure like to see some of that charm around here. Now, I realize now, as I think about it, that Mrs. Johnson had uh, given Fred a silver box. She'd said, here, Fred, you have a charming personality. And what I had done is I had reached out taken the box, and I just tossed it away. Gone. See, I'd taken away the silver box that someone had given him. And I thought about that. And I realized that young Fred could go to Mrs. Johnson's house every day next week. He could go there, and she could say wonderful things to him every day. It wouldn't make a bit of difference. Because, you see, when he brought home that gift to his mother, she just tossed it away. Have you ever done that? Have you ever tossed away the boxes that someone else has given? just taken it away and thrown it, and it's, it's over. As I thought about that, I realized that I had not really given him encouraging words. At that particular point, I had a chance to go to Europe, and I, I prayed about it because I had room for one person to go with me. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, who should I take to Europe? And what came to me was, ask Fred, ask Fred. I thought, I don't want to go with Fred. He doesn't even like me. He wouldn't enjoy three weeks with me. How would he like to be on the bus with me every day, the, the plane with me every day, the same room every night? I didn't want to do that. And so as I thought about it, I, I said, no, Lord, you're wrong. I, I don't want to take Fred. 
the more I prayed, the more it came back to me, ask Fred. And I have learned that when I pray and ask the Lord for something, and he gives me an answer that I don't like, I find out that he's usually speaking to me. You see, I don't have to ask him for things I already know. I never have to pray, Lord, show me the direction to a shopping mall. <laughs> I never have to pray that. I can find those on my own. But when I pray and the Lord gives me an answer I don't like, then I know that he's speaking to me. So I went to my son this day and I said to him, Fred, I've got this terrible trip I have to take. It's not going to be any fun. And I need somebody to go along who will carry the heavy suitcases and who will pass out the papers at the seminars and will do all these things. And as I was explaining it to him, I made this trip sound so burdensome that there's not one of you would have wanted to go with me. But by the time I got through, what I forgot is that my son is melancholy and he likes bad news. <laughs> So by the time I got through this whole thing, he was close to jubilant. <laughs> he said, I'd love to go. So off we went to Europe, and I didn't need to worry as much as I had about it because he slept through most of Europe. If you ever taken a teenager somewhere, totally bored, slept through the whole thing. On the buses, his head would be over against the window all the time. I said, wake up, Fred, these are the Alps. <laughs> He opened his eyes, he looked down the side of the bus, crossed the front of the bus, down the other side of the bus, went back to sleep. I said, stay awake, Fred, these are the Alps. He said, I know, I just saw them. I found out with my son, you've seen one Alp, you've seen them all. One day a girl came up to me that had followed me around and she'd taken pictures of me and, and not nice pictures where I was posed attractively, but pictures of me leaning over water coolers from the rear. So this girl had not endeared herself to me, and she came up one day and she said, your son really loves you. I said, really? And I thought, the boy has come to his senses. He's seen the virtue in his mother. He's, gonna, he's told this girl how wonderful I am, and she's going to repeat it back to me. I could hardly wait. I said, tell me, tell me. She said, well, last night in the bus, you fell asleep. She said, you had your head over against the window. Your mouth was open. You looked real strange. <laughs> She said, so I took my camera out to take a picture of you. She said, I was across the aisle on the bus, and just as I was about to take your picture, she said, your son moved his whole body right in front of you, and he looked at me and said, what are you planning to do? She said, I looked at him and said, I'm going to take a picture of your mother looking strange like that. She said, he looked at me and said, from here on, you will take no more pictures of my mother without asking her permission first. And then she looked at me and said, your son really loves you. And I found out that when the chips are down, my boy is on my side. I also found out that when I'm asleep, he likes me. <laughs> By the end of that trip, I found that I was able to give silver boxes to my son, that I was able to open my mouth. And instead of sarcasm and negatives, what came out were silver boxes, little silver boxes with a bow on top. I then thought about my life and I thought, Florence, how did you ever amount to anything? You started off in Haverhill, Massachusetts, living in three rooms behind your father's store, eating out in front of all the customers. How did you ever amount to anything? And I thought back about it and I realized that my father had been an encourager. His favorite song was Home, Home on the Range, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard what? A discouraging word. Seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. I remembered that. I realized how my father had encouraged me. Then he would give me a silver box early in the morning, and then he'd give me another one, and another, and another. And my father said, get ready for college, even though we don't have any money. Who knows, by the time you're old enough to get there, you might get a scholarship. And I did. My father just daily gave me silver boxes, more boxes every day. And I thought back about that, thought my father did give me many encouraging words. Even though my father had been at 60 years old, unemployed, with three children and a wife 20 years his junior. And I realized that in spite of adverse circumstances, my father was able to encourage others. Are you like that? Do you give out silver boxes everywhere you go? Do people see you coming in the grocery store and they look up and they say, oh, I can hardly wait to talk to her. I know what will come out is little verbal gifts, little words of encouragement, 
little silver boxes with bows on top. Then I thought about my mother. I realized my mother meant well, but somehow my mother didn't give me big silver boxes. I remember when I asked her mother, why don't you give me a compliment? She said, well, you never know when you're going to get a swelled head. Now I realized my mother didn't want to compliment me. And what she did was once in a while give me a little tiny, tiny silver box. Now this is for those of you who don't want to give out very big compliments, just little ones. And you want to perhaps give one today and maybe a little tiny one tomorrow. You don't want anybody to get a swelled head. Maybe next week you'll strain and give out another one and maybe a few weeks later another. And maybe some of you that only give out these little tiny silver boxes could build them up and give out bigger ones and bigger ones and more frequently. Because you see, some of us went through all of life only receiving one or two little tiny silver boxes. And today we're so hungry and our hands are out and we're saying, tell me I'm all right. Give me a box. Give it to me. Oh, how we want to be praised. How we want someone to feel that we're worth something. So maybe you could give out a little bigger than just this tiny little box. As I thought about my father, I realized that he had encouraged me. He taught me things. He, from the time I was little, he was teaching me big words to say, like, people who live in transparent domiciles should refrain from hurling geological specimens promiscuously. <laughs> I'd learned that when I was five years old. He taught me before I went to kindergarten, if the teacher asks you a question, you don't know the answer, say, not knowing to any degree of accuracy, I dare not assert for fear of erring therein. <laughs> now, when you can say things like that when you're five years old, you can learn to fit in just about anywhere in life. So I thought about that. My father had given me out encouraging words. He'd given me silver boxes with bows on top. I thought back to that time when I was a senior in college. My father was 70, my mother was 50, and I was 20. I remember coming home from college that Christmas vacation, and my father said to me, Florence, come in the back room for a minute. We went in behind the store into that one little den that we had with an upright piano and a couch. That was all that was in there. And when you opened the couch, it filled the entire room. And I remember every Sunday evening that we would sit down by that piano. Our church didn't have a Sunday evening service, and my mother would have a sit down. My mother was a violinist and a cellist. I would sit and play hymns on the piano. My mother would play the violin. My brother Ron would play the trumpet. My brother Jim would sing with a beautiful bass voice. My father'd take care of the store. And when there weren't any customers, he'd come in and be there with us. I remembered those Sunday nights around that piano. And my father reached in the back behind that piano, and he pulled out a little old cigar box. I didn't know there was anything hidden behind that piano, but he reached in there and he pulled out this little box. And I said, what's that? He said, open it and see. So I opened it, and I looked inside the box. It was filled with newspaper clippings. And I looked at them, I said, what are these? He said, read one. I took it out and I read it. At the bottom it said, Walter Chapman, my father's name. And I looked at him, I said, did you write these? He said, yes. Now you see, I was in college trying to learn how to write and my father had a box full of clippings that had already been published. And I looked at them, I was amazed. And I said to him, I didn't know you could write. And he said, well, that's because your mother told me that since I didn't have an education, I shouldn't try to write. Because what if I wrote and it wasn't any good, we'd all be embarrassed. And I looked at my father. I had no idea my mother had said that to him. I did know that she'd said it to me. I did know that my mother had fed me little lines like, your father has no education. Your father shouldn't try to do that because he hasn't been trained for that. I remember little negatives that my mother had fed me about my father, but I didn't know she'd told him. And here he was, he had this box of clippings. And I said, how did it happen? He said, well, I didn't want to hurt your mother. So when she'd be away, I would go out in the store and I'd sit down and I'd write an article. And I'd mail it into a newspaper and I'd watch and watch. And he said, they always published it. So he said, I clipped them all out. I put them all in this box and I've kept them right here behind the piano. And he said, just today, somehow I felt like, like showing it to you. He handed me the box and he said, I won't have any money to leave you. He said, this is all I've got. This box of clippings, his box of broken dreams. What could have been if only someone had given him encouraging words. My father tucked the box back behind the piano and we walked out of the room. And as we did, he said to me, I guess I tried for something too big this time. I said, what's that? He said, well, uh, I wrote an article for our denominational magazine. And he said, I, I thought it was the best thing I'd ever written. 
I wrote and told them how they ought to change the way they choose the National Nominating Committee and put it into a more equitable manner. But he said, I, I've never heard from them, and it's been three months. And then he put his hand on my shoulder and he looked at me and he said, Florence, I guess your mother's right. I don't have any talent. Those were the last words my father said directly to me. Because the next morning, my father and mother went to Boston for the first day off they'd had together in over 20 years. And as they were walking through Park Street Station in Boston, Massachusetts, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon the next day, my father dropped to the pavement. A nurse came through the crowd, knelt down over him, looked up at my mother and said, he's dead. My mother stood there, shocked. All of a sudden, her supporter had gone. All of a sudden, her encourager was dead, and she stood there straddled over the body for over an hour before anyone came to help. People walked over him, around him, and on him, and she stood there trying to protect him. She went with the ambulance to the morgue, home alone on the train, then home alone on the bus. And that evening, my brothers and I looked out, and my mother walked across the square. She walked into the store, and we looked up, and we said, where's Daddy? And she said, He's dead. At the morning of the funeral, I was going through the greeting cards that had come in. People had written sympathy messages because, you see, everybody loved him. And as I was going through those, I, I saw our, our denominational magazine. I would never have looked at it if he hadn't told me that. And I flipped through it, and in there I found my father's article for more democracy. It came the day of the funeral. I'm glad my father showed me that box that day because, you see, it was all he left me. He didn't leave me any money. He didn't have any possessions. But he did leave me with that box, that legacy, what could have been if only someone had given him encouraging words. I have that article. I have it framed on the wall with my father's picture. I have it right over my desk where I write. And every time I sit down to write another book, I look up and I say to myself, my father's life wasn't wasted that I'm doing what he could have done if only someone had given him encouraging words. He just left me with that box, the box of broken dreams. What could have been if only someone had given him encouraging words? A few years ago, I was visiting with my mother-in-law, and I remember as I sat there looking at her, I had never been left alone with her much, and I remember as I was sitting there that I thought, what can I say to her? A very strong, imposing woman, always looked like she had life together, was so strong that when she walked into a room, you tended to back up and let her take over. And I sat there with her one night, and I thought, what in the world do you say to your aging mother-in-law? And so I said to her mother, what was life like when you were young? And she brightened right up, and she looked like a young girl, and she said, oh, I had this boyfriend when I was in college. Somehow you never think your mother-in-law had a boyfriend. She said he was so handsome and he was going to be a lawyer and she told me about how he looked and she said, I, I took him home once to meet my parents and they asked him point blank, is your family rich? And she said, I was so embarrassed and he said, well, no, they aren't. She said, my mother pulled me aside and said to me, it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich person as a poor one, get rid of him. And I said, well, did you? She said, no, I continued to date him till the end of school. She said, we both graduated. She graduated from Cornell at 19. And she said, he went with his family for the summer. I went with mine. And he told me in the fall he was going to call me up. Now, she was saying this all excited. And she said, but the fall came. And her face dropped. And she said, he never called. I said, what do you mean he never called? The man you married, we're going to marry? He, he never called? She said, that's right. He, he never called. I said, why didn't you call him? She said, in those days, girls didn't call boys. She said, plus the fact very few people had telephones. She said, I waited and waited. He never called. And I looked at her, and she said, after a while, my mother introduced me to Fred Litauer. And she said, he comes from a wealthy family. They're into silk. You could fall in love with him. She said, so I started dating him. And after a while, we got engaged. And Ultimately, we got married, and then she looked at me and she burst into tears, and she said, but I never was in love with him. I was dumbfounded that my mother-in-law would say that, that she never was in love with my father-in-law. She said, oh, I did the right things. I raised the five children. I was a good wife. I tried to be good. But she said, my whole life, I, I waited for that phone call. 
And then I didn't know what to say, and as I was sitting there, she said, but that's not the end. She said, a few years ago, I was at a party here in Miami, and she said, I, I was standing there, and I looked across the room, and there was this man standing. She was, I was in my 70s, and I looked at him, and he had a profile like that man I'd loved in college. She said, so I, I walked over there, and I got in a position where I could look up at him. She said, as I looked up at him, he looked down at me. She said, he looked at me and he said, you're Marita. She said, I looked up at him and said, and you're John. She says, we just stared at each other for a minute. And then I said to him, John, tell me, why did you never call me? She said, he looked at me and he said, oh, Marita, I called you many times. And every time I called, I got your mother. And your mother said, you didn't love me. You never wanted to hear from me again. And he said, the last time I called, your mother told me you were engaged to marry somebody else. My mother-in-law started to sob, and she said, my mother's words ruined my life. I didn't know where to go with that, and I sat there, and I thought, I've got to change the subject here. So I said, mother, if you could have been anything you wanted to be, what would it have been? She said, oh, I, I, I would have been an opera singer. I said, an opera singer? I didn't even know you could sing. She said, well, that's because I haven't sung since I got out of college. And I said, did you sing in college? She said, oh, yes, I majored in music. I never knew that. Of course, I'd never asked her anything about her life. I'd never sat down and been interested in her before. And I said, well, tell me about it. She said, oh, I majored in music. I was going to be an opera singer. And I went home and I told my parents about it. And they said, you don't have any talent. You'll never make it as a singer. Singers are a dime a dozen. Forget all that foolishness. Come into the family business where you'll make some money. She said, so I gave it all up. And I went into the family business and I've, I've made a lot of money. And then she looked at me, she said, but I've been miserable. She got up from the chair, she went down the hall and she came back carrying a box. Isn't it interesting that my father had a box? Fred's mother had a box. She opened up the box and it was full of pictures. And she reached in and she pulled out this picture. She said, see this picture? This is when I was in college. She said, see right there, it's a stage setting. I'm right in the center. I'm in that wing chair. She said, see, I had the lead in the opera. Oh, she smiled like a young girl as she showed me this picture. There she was in the center of the stage in a costume. I had the lead in the opera. She handed me the picture. She said, here, take this. Give it to your daughter, Marita. She's named after me. Show it to her and let her know that her grandmother could have been somebody if only someone had given her encouraging words. I took that picture, the evidence of what could have been if only someone had given her encouraging words. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, many of us die with the music still in us. Fred's mother died with the music still in her and left behind for me a picture, a picture, a representation of the broken dreams, what could have been if only someone had given her encouraging words. Today, I want you to think about yourself. There may be some of you here today that have never amounted to what you know you could have been if only someone had given you encouraging words. I want to tell you today to throw away any of the shackles that people put on you, any of those comments about you couldn't amount to anything, you didn't have any talent, you weren't any good, you'd never make it. Why don't you forget all that idea? Throw that away today and let's start over. Because you see, I come as an encourager today. I come to tell you, no matter what age you are, it is never too late. It's never too late to start again. You see, I didn't write my first book till I was almost 50. And I've now written 18 and I'm still alive. And I look around at that and I say, it's never too late. Even if nobody ever gave you any silver boxes, let's get rid of that today and ask the Lord to take away those negative thoughts and memories that you might become what it is that he has in mind for you to be. Because you see, I don't want you to die 
with the music still in you. I don't want to die with the music still in me. And I want to get out as many books, as many messages, as many places to speak as I possibly can. Because I know that we're not all going to live forever, and I want to be sure that I don't die with the music still in me. I'd like you also to think today about your children, your mate. Are you the kind of person that's giving out silver boxes everywhere you go? Or are you someone that doesn't give out any at all, or maybe just little tiny, tiny ones here and there? Because you see, there may be somebody waiting for you at home, someone who's waiting to be encouraged and lifted up. That person might be next to you right now. Maybe you need to give an encouraging word. Maybe you have to say something positive. Maybe you have to make a phone call, write a letter. Lift someone up. Because you see, everyone's waiting to receive a little silver box with a bow on top. So I want to ask you today to think. Do you know someone, possibly someone like Fred's mother? Someone who has a song waiting to be sung? Perhaps some art waiting to be hung? Perhaps a piece waiting to be played? Or a scene waiting to be staged? Someone that has a tale waiting to be told? or perhaps even a book waiting to be sold, a rhyme waiting to be read, perhaps a speech waiting to be said. If you know someone like that, don't let them die with the music still in them.